when, when it gets to a good juicy part, you're going to, we want to feel it. She can do it, and I'll tell you why. You want to know why? Because the Lord's her strength. We bought Destiny House. Uh, we closed on it February, whatever the date was. It was Valentine's Day in 2011. Our offices were back here, and so we had to clean up Destiny House, and we moved the offices up there. Then we demoed Solid Rock. Do you remember that season of... Yeah. Remember peeling that glue up off the floor? It took forever. Man. But when we did that, Solid Rock was closed down for about three months. And I told Christy, I said, I've got an idea. For, for the three months they do that, I'll involve the children one way or another in our services. And so, what's that, 13 years ago? And Christy told me, you know who can read really well is Kirsten. I said, I've never heard her talk. Because remember, you were real quiet as a little kid. And uh, you stood at this pulpit, and your little head just, you could just barely see over it, and you read the verses I'd give you. We did that, with, remember, we did that with all the kids. It was, it was pretty fun, so we're going to see if she still's got it. Yeah? All right, let's receive our offering. Get the envelopes out. I don't want to wait much longer. I want to hear you read. Okay, here's my funny for today. I uh, mentored Aaron. He has a tormentor at school, a little boy named Emmanuel. And apparently Emmanuel did something to him just before I got there. And when I got my guy out in the hallway, he said, I'm not going anywhere until you go in and tell the teacher he has to apologize. He's barking at me a little. I said, I am not going in that classroom. You're going to take a deep breath and calm down, boy. He said, I already punched him once today. I said, <laughs> but it took a couple minutes of talking him off the cliff. Then I got him to move and. I asked him a question. Uh, I said, I have two questions. One question is, what is it that makes you mad? He wouldn't talk about it. I said, I'm not going to do it to you. I just, I want to know what to avoid. And so he was quiet. Then I said, okay, what makes you really happy? He, he wouldn't answer me again. So I said, you know, going to the movies, eating desserts. You know, I said, I want to be your friend. I, I don't want to do something you don't want to do. I already know he doesn't like green beans. So I can't bring any green beans in. <laughs> no? Green bean casserole, maybe? Oh, glory. So we had an interesting day. I, I'm going to keep pressing him a little. I'll squeeze him. But I had a major victory today because I finally fixed my insurance website. Hallelujah. I've been months trying to get it. Uh, actually, Aaron helped me. But just before that happened, I'm in the kitchen at Destiny House. I'm going to fill my water bottle up. Bend down to fill my water bottle up, and a little towhead boy run by and smacked me on the bottom. <laughs> and he giggled as he ran away. I said, well, this is an unusual day. <laughs> and then I asked Rachel, what's this little boy see at home? Oh. I mean, it's legal. Okay, it's legal. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, they're married, aren't they? They, they? He can do a little public affection if he wants, or, she, or it might be her doing it. I don't know. <laughs> that was pretty funny. That might be a first in my pastoral career. Trying to think if it's ever happened before. <laughs> and he ran, he's got the cutest little devious chuckle because he knew he did something. <laughs> I haven't even told Kevin yet. <laughs> How was your day? <laughs> Boring? No? Okay, well, let's stand up. <laughs> it's a true story, it happened. 
I'm just wondering how long he's been considering doing that. <laughs> oh, glory. Father, thank you for little children who are very innocent. May they grow up and be wise and strong and full of faith. And Father, we worship you with this offering tonight. We confess that you are our shepherd and we shall not want or lack any single good thing. We bless your name and in, uh, in turn, I reciprocate blessing upon your people. May they be blessed coming and going in the country, in the city, and may their bodies be healthy, healthy, healthy in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Frioli sends her love. She got a virus of some kind, woke up with a severe cramp this morning. And I haven't even told her about Oliver yet. I know she'll get a kick out of that. All right, be before I preach, this isn't my preaching, uh, but we have a, a little good, goody surprise coming up. On May 12th, Sunday, May 12th, Mother's Day, we're having Pastor Andrew back. He's going to be in the state, so Hallelujah. Okay, are you guys good with that? Yes. Are you good with it, AJ? Come on, say it one time. Hallelujah. Run up here. It's going to be fun, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> he's, he's a prophet, so he's, I, I would be totally dialed in, and we'll just let him do whatever he both services. We had a we had an option for two Wednesday nights, but I want Sunday. I like the the double punch. Okay, so get your faith on it, and then just weeks after that, our friend Josh Barkley will be here. Isn't that cool? We'll we'll probably be different by the time those two guys come here and, here and rock our. I pray they just stretch our faith. That we want more, and we do more. You also want to hear something funny? We're looking at the calendar to do the uh, June leaders meeting. And there's one date, but then there's June 2nd. And I said, you know, that's when Josh comes in. Let me tell the story for you last. So we have Josh come in, preach Sunday morning, and then do our leaders meeting. Somebody... Somebody without hesitation said, no. It wasn't that one. It wasn't Kareem. I attribute it to the fear of God. You were joking? I hope I forget that before Josh gets here. You're not going to be here that day. All right, I won't tell Josh. I don't want to give him a complex or anything. Do you think Josh Barkley could do a leaders meeting? No, we're not going to do it just for Rachel's benefit. In fact, Rachel said, I'd rather lead the meeting than have Josh do it. Oh, he's quite equipped to do leadership. But this time we won't do it, okay? He might mess up everything we've got going. You don't think he will? There's only one way to find out, you know. <laughs> the, the thing that's cool about Josh, he's like his father. He'll ask me, anything that you want me to do? Preach on, teach on, anything you don't want me to preach on, any, any other way I can help you in your church. And if I was to say, I want you to preach the a.m. and p.m., and I want you to do the leadership meeting in between them, he would say, okay. And he'd eat our potluck meal. He is a church guy. He's eaten many potluck dinners. Okay? But Pastor Andrew in May, Josh in June, and Stacy Bonet in August. What you? This is good news. 
great news? She's a preacher. She's like uh, Lady Fran. Remember Lady Fran? She's a preacher. We could use another dose of her too. All right. Go to Proverbs 17. Let's see, what else do I have to tell you? Taylor, you're going to have to sit closer to your sister if you're going to converse with her during the service. We got a sister, this is the sister's thing here tonight. Except your little sister's not engaged in it. I mean, it's sister to sister. You already nipped at her. <laughs> yeah, quit staring at me. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to regroup here. We're here? We're just being too real, aren't we? Have you found the 17th chapter? Proverbs. And again I say unto you, Proverbs 17. Man. Oh, you're going to love, you're going to love, love, love this passage right here. Verse 3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. You know, that burns out the infirmities in there, right? But the Lord tests the heart. Just as that fire tests the quality of gold and silver. You might not know this, but from time to time, the Lord will test you. Not with sin. Okay? You don't need God helping you with that. Who tests the heart? All right, Kirsten, Matthew 22. Hang on now. I'll tell you where to start and stop. Matthew 22. Let, hang on now. Should we have her stand up? Yes? There's a mic right there. Let's see. I want you to go from verse 1 to verse 14. Come stand at the, at the pulpit. So we can get an updated photo. One through fourteen. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, parables, and said, "The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son." And sent out his servants who called those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner by oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, and one, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants threat, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when, but when the king heard about it, he was furious, Ooh. and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Mm. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into the dar darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Verse 14 again. For many are called, but few are chosen. One more time. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thank you. Man, you got it, kid. Wasn't that good? I was waiting for a huh? So this guy gets bound and put into outer darkness 
because he didn't have a wedding coat or wedding garment. And as I studied this, uh, my notes here out of Dake said that uh, oftentimes whoever was throwing the wedding had wedding garments available that you could put on when you got there. And this cat showed up and chose not to. That's why he was speechless. Now, this isn't a garment contest. This isn't a wardrobe story. It's somebody who was not qualified to be there. And what, what did verse 14 say again? Now, does that still apply today? Do you think that process works for ministers? I know a lot of people who have called that they, they're not preaching because they failed tests. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect in everything you do. You have to have the intent of being perfect. But I, I'll, read, I'll read one more to you, okay? Go to the 20th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 20, verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he, now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, Why have, why have you been standing there idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So an evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the stewards, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. Ha! But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Didn't he? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give it to the last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I'm good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. So there was a test that went on here. And the early, the early shift guys didn't pass the test. I mean, they got what they were promised. But in their own mind, they thought, those guys aren't equal to getting what we're getting, etc. So here we have Jesus saying this statement again. Many are called, few are chosen. Right? Jesus said this in two, two separate parables. There's a, there's a parable of the ten virgins. You guys ever heard that one? Would they run out of Kool-Aid? Oil. And they said, hey, come on, give us some of your oil. And they said, no. Because they were instructed to be, I wish I had more time to tell you about it, but they were instructed to be ready 24-7 for months at a time. And they were caught off guard. The five were. And so many are called, few are chosen. Now, do you, I want to picture this right. I don't think God's up in heaven just saying, I like that one, I don't like that one. I think there's a process every one of us have to go through in order to qualify ourselves for, to be used by God. He, okay, got it? Want me to preach more on that? But the Lord tests the hearts. Just like that fire test, the gold? All right. The test allows us to see where we're at. Now, honestly, I could give you a lot of examples of, of the testing process. Um, anybody ever been put in a... Well, let's just talk about our one brother or sister in this church that is weak on patience. Is it possible that at least one person in our church is not developed in patience? 
Could it be that they, they hear a sermon on patience and then they say, I've got it, I've heard this. But then in their life, they come home from work or come home from school and say, you wouldn't believe the dinglings I had to be around all day. You wouldn't believe how long I had to stand in the line. I've been waiting for this for weeks. Does it sound like patience is being tested? Yeah? How about we have a brother or sister? I found out sisters can be mean too. And... Uh, Let's see if we can find somebody who's weak in patience and weak in complaining. And then you stand before God and say, I'm good. I'm ready for any assignment. As long as it doesn't require positive attitude and patience. Could, could this be why sometimes in your life you're placed in adverse situations with adverse people? I remember a great training ground I used to uh, experience is when I worked construction. I'd work with different guys all the time. A lot of time I had my own small crew of three or four guys, but we worked with different electricians, different plumbers, uh, brick guys, the tin knockers, and some were great to get along with and others were just dinglings. Some of them had a potty mouth. And that wasn't enjoyable to be around. And I learned... Not to pray to get them out of my life, but to outshine them. It worked. Amen. Many are called. So the Lord sometimes will put you in a spot where you can see. All right, go to First Peter. I don't know. This might be something coming up in your future, so just put it in your back pocket for today. And then you'll say, this is what he was talking about. Let's see, 1 Peter, 4th chapter, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, who's that referring to? Christians, right? Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Don't think it strange. I have, a, I have a prophetic word for everybody in here tonight. Somewhere in your life, you'll have a fiery trial. And it won't be because God's mad at you. Uh, you're just walking in the perfect will of God. And you'll get some headwind. You'll get some resistance. You'll get some adversity. Now, let's not be confused here. If you become lukewarm or you backslide, you're going to face some trials. Uh, those are called self-inflicted wounds. But every one of those trials is, is meant to push you back to the kingdom. Okay? This we're talking about that there's going to be things in your life that you're going to have to go through. You can't go around them. You've got to go through them. Personal development, relationships, money, transit, transition, testing what you really believe, testing your maturity level in Christ. Anybody ever had a... Uh, fiery trial? I've had a few. It's been kind of quiet, so I'm, I'm, I'm being prepared. I'm praying like I'm in one, because a lot of times in that trial, man, we, we're very dialed in to God. Nobody's got to tell you to pray, to confess, to, to, to taste every word you speak, but when it goes good is when we kind of put the shield of faith down and just coast, and, and then bang. So just stay prayed up. Just stay prayed up. Now, my note for this verse says, in order to do anything for God, we will be tested. And you guys are shouting so loud, I'll have to say it again. In order to do anything for God, you will be tested. Okay? Before you think you want to go 
to an international destination, you'll be tested. Before you get on this platform to join the worship team, you'll be tested. Yeah? Et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Good preaching, Pastor. All right, go to the first chapter. Why do we have to be tested? Why can't I just tell God, I'm good? I'm all ready. My patience, my faith, my love, everything is perfect, God. Well, it might be perfect at this level. I mean, you might be the smartest third grader there is. But when you get to fourth grade and fifth grade, unless you're like Trevor and you just start out in eighth grade at I'd forgot that he skipped kindergarten. Didn't he? He started early when he was four. I liked first grade so much I did it two years in a row. <laughs> Which that was a blessing in disguise because, because of my size. It helped me in sports because I competed against just a little slightly younger group of kids. Na da da. Who, who won that one? Okay, why do we have to be tested? First Peter, first chapter, verse six. In this you greatly rejoice, though though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith is being tested. Hallelujah. It could be tested with people, with circumstances, with discomfort, with lack with rejection. I wonder if Dr. Barkley's ever been tested. Think so? Do you know what happened this week on Monday morning? My, one of my favorite preachers went to heaven. Dr. Jerry Savell went to heaven Monday morning. He, he impacted my life. I have a picture of him sitting with him at Doc Barkley's. It's pretty cool. Too late to get an autograph now. I don't need an autograph picture. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you think uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith was tested? How was it tested? In the fiery furnace? But I, I heard that furnace wasn't that hot. So prove to me how hot it was. The people outside that threw them in the fire got burned, consumed. Do you think Daniel was tested? The kitty cat. Huh? Was, was King David ever tested? How about a man named Joseph? If you want to do a good Bible study, look at what Joseph went through to get where he was at. I mean, he received this wonderful promise and these visions, and then it went about face. His brothers sold him. and all that. I mean, that's an amazing process that he went through. But, but if you study that out in the book of Psalms, it says, but the Lord tested him because he was going to use him to save a nation. So you just can't have anybody from the church to do that. You have to have somebody that knows how to be tough. And how, even in the midst of tremendous adversity, you still know how to trust God and, and worship God. All right, I'll, I'll get ahead of myself here a little bit. I believe this. Sometimes I think the Lord stirs our life up or puts us in a, in a totally uneasy situation just to see if we'll complain. Where's God? Why'd God let this happen? 
How come Trevor doesn't get this and I do? We find out there's still a little bit of yuck down in there. You're not totally trusting him. So pass that test, okay? In your life, things will happen that you don't understand. Now, that's not the norm. It's the exception. And so I live by the, by the philosophy of someday I'll find out what's going on. And, and if it doesn't, if I don't, then it wasn't that important. Because I kind of keep looking forward. I, I'll give you this. This isn't part of this, but I read a, a really amazing article about success and traits successful people have. And do you know what the number one thing was? It wasn't education. It was you have to know how to move on. You have to, ha- you have to know how to say that's done. I'm not going to cry about it anymore. I'm not going to tell everybody about it. I'm not going to sit in a puddle and cry and say, because that happened. I've learned, I think maybe this might be my key to longevity pastoring the same church is when people have left our church, I just let them go. I mean, sometimes I'd contact him, but this isn't the county jail. You, you, you come here, it's because you want to come here. And if you leave, I don't want you to leave. I want everybody to stay, but not everybody stays. But I don't go, my ministry's ended now because this 10 people left. I just move on, look for the next 10. I've been, this might have been my little catchphrase lately when I invite people, especially people that used to come here. I tell them, we got a seat saved for you. They didn't quite know how to respond to that. <laughs> Write this verse down. <laughs> <You boy. laughs> he just leaned over and made eye contact with me. And went. Who teaches him this stuff? Really? Oh, how cute. <laughs> All right, you ready to write this verse down? Isaiah, I, Isaiah 48 and 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. The furnace of affliction. That does not sound like a nice place to be. Now, that can be a lot of different examples for you, but that lets me know God watched me when I was in the furnace. Okay, another golden nugget. So I was in the furnace of affliction. God watched my behavior, my attitude, me using my faith. You know what that tells this guy? You might not see me all the time, but God sees me all the time. That'll change the way you live if you're just fully aware that there might not be one human set of eyes on you, but you have to know, my master's watching. Hallelujah. Okay, that was good. Go to James. Glory be to God. Do you think these guys that wrote these verses know anything about the furnace of affliction? Think about Jesus. Everywhere he went was either revival or a riot. You know, I guess I might have preached some bad sermons in my life, but they never said, let's take him out back and throw him off the cliff. They did that to Jesus. And they did that to Paul. All the apostles, were, except for one, were martyred. And I have to believe... Well, for example, I, I thought about this story the other day. I, I think I referenced it not too long ago, but Dr. Summerall had a church, had that church in South Bend. They had a missionary in, and during the afternoon he was praying that God would raise up missionaries through this man's ministry. And while he was praying that, the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go to the Philippines, Manila, Philippines, and start a church. And he was praying that missionaries would be raised up out of that church. And, uh, and at that time, his church was one of the largest in America. And so he had to take an ocean liner to the Philippines, and he was in the Assemblies of God at that time. 
and they blessed him. They said, we got you. When he got to the Philippines, there was a wire waiting for him that said, you're no longer affiliated with us. We are not going to support you. You're not getting any financial help. Don't put our name on any of your stuff. You're out there on your own. Well, you know, doctor, he just went, huh. And he did what God called him to do. So the, you hear that. There's a massive church that he started. Of course, it wasn't a massive church when he started. He said the first six to eight months that he was in Manila, there was no church service except for his wife and three little boys. And he said, this was a good thing he told me. He said, being a man, it's, 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 it's wired into a man to be productive. So he, he didn't have an office to go to. He didn't have a church to go to. He said, I would get dressed. I'd get cleaned up and look professional. And I would go to the park and I would study my Bible. And it was just like I was going to a regular job. And he would go and meet with, with God. And then, do you, you know how his church grew there in the Philippines? He cast that demon out of that woman. And uh, that's pretty powerful. Took him, he told me it took him three days, three separate encounters. And uh, because one of the, one of the uh, jail, the guards at the jail smacked that woman. And a day later, they found him dead at his desk and her locked up in her jail cell. So there's some real demonic stuff going on there. But can you imagine going six or eight months without just preaching at your wife and kids and pretending like, you know, you're on the other side of the world and the help you were promised is no longer there? I, I, I'm pretty sure that had to be a did I miss God kind of time. But he didn't miss God. God had something way beyond what he had planned. Pretty cool. But the property that they have for the church in the Philippines is right downtown. It's, it's premier land. And this is how he got that land. He didn't pay for it. After he cast the demon out of that, out of that girl, and then people started coming to his meetings, uh, some people were not happy about it. And the Philippines is, is predominantly Catholic, and the Catholics didn't like it. But um, Nonetheless, his church began to grow, and people began to get saved, and people began to get healed, and uh, some adversity rose up. They wanted to pass a law that he couldn't preach being an American. And he finally, he went, uh, the lower courts didn't touch him. All these were just threats, but they took him to the highest court in the Philippines. The guy, the ultimate, the end of the line judge was there, and uh, he walked in. Nobody knew it, but the judge's wife had been going to Dr. Summerall's church. And she'd been coming home telling him, this happened and this happened and this preacher's amazing. And so when the judge saw him, he just slammed that gavel down and said, no, this man can do what he wants to do. And, and doctor told me, he said, at first he was freaked out, but it'd be like you going to the Supreme Court and not, and not the Kalamazoo Court or not the federal court in Grand Rapids, but you're going right to the big one. And Dr. Summerall said that the wisdom and, and beauty of that is if he had went to one of those lower courts and they would have banned him, he'd have been banned. But he went to the top first, boom. And then the city gave him that land. It's pretty cool. And his nephew took the church over, David Summerall, after Dr. left. That's a, I mean, that's a pretty cool story. Remember, all things work together for good to those who love God. Even though for six, eight months he was weird. <laughs> and, and even then they even were on run you out of town. Oh, that was good. That helped, that helped the young preacher's faith. That's why that day I went and had the famous glass rattling story with him. That's why he spoke from his experience. This is what you do. I don't want to. I want a hug. <laughs> I didn't get a hug that day. I got a hug later when he said, Good job, son. All right, James 1. Oh, you guys know this verse. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all the devil. Count it all what? When you do what? So I'm supposed to go good. The odds are against me again. Oh, good. I don't have enough. Hallelujah. That's the area where you fake it till you make it, okay? 
You might not have the emotion to do it, just, but just obey the Bible. Just when somebody says, oh, come on, you're in denial. Just say, I'm just being, I'm following the Scripture, the instruction of the Scripture. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What does it produce? So I was not born with a high level of patience? None? No, I've had to develop my patience. And it wasn't through a 12-week Bible study. It was through life and getting the wisdom from the Scriptures and knowing what to do in those tough situations. Knowing how to stand, you stand there for it. You count it joy because something's going to be produced. Now listen, you guys are the ones saying, praying, God, I want to be a strong Christian. God, I want to be the man or woman that you can depend on. Oh, good. Let's put her in various trials. Let's let her walk through that valley instead of around that valley. Now, I will say this. He's, he's not unjust and he's not, he's not aware of your position in life. So you're never going to be in a various trial that you're not capable of handling. handling. It's, not like, it's not like Oliver and I are going to go through the same test. He'll go through an Oliver test that's at his level. I'll go through a test of my experience and, and longevity with God. But he's not going to put you in where you're going to get swallowed up, but you are going to learn something. Hallelujah. And here we go. All right, let's keep reading. But let, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I would like to lack nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Anyone lacks wisdom? Well, sometimes in a trial you need to say what's going on. Which direction am I going? Are you? You have to develop your patience. All right, go to Philippians 2 then. I'll, I'll let you off in a minute. I, I'll tell you a st another story since it's story night. I once had a man who helped me start this church. And uh, he didn't last very long. His intent was right. His technique was off. And... Uh, he was kind of a manipulative person. And so it quickly came to an end. But anyway, one time we were, we were driving together and we, came, we were going southbound on Sprinkle Road and we had just gone by the holy landmark of this side of town, the Sweetwater's Donut Mill, okay? And just past that is that Speedway gas station on the corner. And there's a stoplight. And there's a left turn signal. Y'all know that intersection? And uh, I was with him. I was the passenger in his car. And he whipped into the Speedway parking lot and cut the corner and came out on the other side. And I said, what are you doing? He said, that's the longest light in Kalamazoo right there. I, uh, and, he, and he gave me his excuse about how busy and important he was. And no, he's not going to hell for that. But I just thought to myself, this guy cuts corners, literally, and in his life. I'm sure there are a lot of things that he thought weren't necessary, and there's his way was better. Sometimes God wants you to sit at a traffic light, a traffic light of life. Now, I got a wife rebuke. Well, it was a little spank. It wasn't like a full rebuke. But I was in second in line at the red light, and the light turned green. And the guy in front of me, I don't know what he or she was doing, but they were not looking at the light. And so I'm practicing my patience. 1,001. It's not going to get any greener. And, and Kevin Marie said, listen, mister, just calm yourself down. Why should I lose my cool over? I mean, even as, as important as I am. And then actually my next thought was this person's in a 2,000-pound automobile and they're distracted. They're danger. So I let him pull ahead of me a little bit. But then I passed him. I said, Kevin, give him the stink eye. 
just just do it. You, she wouldn't do it. She just would not cooperate that day. Mm-hmm. Did you find Philippians 2? All right, so what's the various trial produce? Patience. Philippians 2 and 22. Well, I'll go verse 19. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who, is, who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Highlight that those two words, proven character. That means your character has been tested and it passed the test. Doesn't that make you want a sense? I want to be, I want to be identified by my pastor and my leadership as a person who has proven character. Because if I ever send you on a mission trip or a ministry representing this church and our Jesus and my name, uh, I will be sure you have proven character. That way, if you feel led to go to Hawaii and preach and the church sends you there, and then, then I call the pastor that you were helping, and they'll say, we haven't seen him. We haven't seen her. I, and I would say, I guess they're not quite ready to be out there. This is a funny story. This is a long time ago. At Kids Hope, we had uh, when the Green Meadow, we were doing it at Green Meadow, we had a lady call me from the office, and she was a, a therapist or a tutor or something, and she called to let me know that one of our mentors was very rude, curt, and should not be around children. And I'm thinking to myself, well, there might be some in the congregation. You know, I know not everybody can do Kids Hope, but I thought to myself, man, that's a pretty vicious person there. And so I told Kevy, I said, who was at the school today from 1 to 2? And she said, oh, Ellen. And I, I'm not even going to bring this up. First of all, if you got Ellen mad, you probably deserved it. You, you, you probably had it fully coming. But then I thought to myself, I've known Ellen Thompson for years. And she, has a, she could represent me anywhere she goes. Todd, on the other hand, so he's a little iffy. No, he's not iffy, though. I've sent Todd to Malaysia ahead of me for a week, and he was right where he was supposed to be when I got into Kuala Lumpur. Pretty cool. And so I want, I want my pastor to consider me I have proven character because he's seen me in, in true adversity before. He's seen me when I've been hurt and what I'm wondering, when's this going to stop? I didn't sow any of this. But as far as I'm concerned with you guys, is we're all developing proven character. Why do you think tithing is so important? You're proving. Every time you tithe, you're proving that God is one in your life. Every time you do it. When you give offerings above that 10%, you're proving that you're generous. And every time you let something go and move on, you're proving, I'm a forgiver. I'm not going to hold on that and keep talking about it all my life. I, I, uh, close your Bibles. I'm going to stop or try to stop. But I just want to give you hope. But I, I invited a man and wife to church, and they said, we used to go to church. And she told a story about how one of the women in the church hurt her feelings. And it was a goofy kind of thing. And I said, when was that? And she said, it was about 12 years ago. I said, it's time for you to move on, baby. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, you know, neglecting the fact that your feelings were hurt, but you're going to let one church weirdo interfere with your destiny? And then I told her, you come to my church, that'll never happen, because all the women in this church, well, most of them, they're... <laughs> 
Right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't pick on somebody about their clothes, would you? Or their hair? No, you wouldn't? You, you wouldn't? How will I know that for sure? We'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it, huh? Hallelujah. So I said, it, you know, you need to get over this. You've missed a lot of good stuff. You could be in a whole different place in your life. All right, close your Bibles, as, he, as I told you, right? I don't know what you're going through, but you keep your eyes on Jesus, okay? You keep looking for the door. You keep looking for the way out. And uh, sometimes, you know, my great academic background, there's some tests you have to take. I like the multiple choice questions myself. I could say, that word looks familiar. I've heard that one before. Maybe it was when I was in this class. And that's how I got the 2.2. Stand up, please. AJ, do you like multiple choice questions or do you like the essay question? Essay? Okay. Multiple choice or short answers? True or false? You know, I preached for an hour and couldn't get a peep out of you. And now revivals hit the room. Wow. <laughs> Essay, really? Show how smart you are? Work it just right. I never looked at it that way. Because you study too hard, you just have to skim it. You don't got to own it, you just got to skim it so something's familiar. Shelly, multiple choice or essay? True or false? Jeremy likes it all, he's not afraid of nothing. Red wire or green wire? Which one do you cut for the bomb? <laughs> okay. Order in the court. Let's pray good, a good night prayer, all right? Father, we're grateful for the blood of Jesus over our lives. We thank you for the new creation that we are. But yet, Father, we want to be used in your kingdom. We want you to be proud of us. And so we just put ourselves in a position where we're not afraid to be tested. We're going to look at every challenge as an opportunity to be promoted in life and in the kingdom of God. I speak strength and courage and boldness over your people today that we never look at adversity uh, the same way again. We're going to say this is a chance to excel. Bless your people. May they have a beautiful night's sleep uh, tonight. Bless them in whatever they set their hand to do tomorrow. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. and amen.